if you are here for the topic that was listed at, as dormant pruning, you're in the right spot. <laughs> uh, my name is Marshall Lehman, and I'm a Knox County Master Gardener. And presenting with me today is Breton Race, another Master Gardener. And in fact, the title is Dormant Pruning, Nibble While They Sleep. So we're focused on the things that would normally get pruned this time of year. But first, we did promise we would touch on the Arctic blast, or whatever you want to call that Christmas freeze that we got. Um, this, this chart, I happen to have a personal weather station at home that records a lot of data. So that comes directly from my weather station. We had 105 consecutive hours of sub-freezing temperatures. Now, 32, 31, 30 is not a big deal, but when you look at this, we got down, the low was 3.9, I'll round that off to 4 degrees. So that is not typical, and that is a much colder temperature than the flat, than what you would find on the hardiness zone. Most of us are in the hardiness zone 7A. 7A does not go down into single digits. So we were much colder than normal for our environment, and that's what did the damage. So our advice to you is yes, do go out and walk around, start to assess the damage on your plants, but don't do anything yet. It's tempting, especially if you've got some herbaceous perennials that just kind of turn to mush. Actually, that dead foliage is providing some insulation to the crown and the roots, so if you can tolerate looking at it, leave it for a bit longer. The other is you may notice new growth starting to come up. So that new growth is really tender and it will need that insulation because we're still in winter. Now, we're probably not going to have another one of these flash freezes. Oh, you just cursed it. See, I just cursed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but go ahead and on your normal dormant pruning schedule, you can do dormant pruning, but don't be surprised if, as those plants you pruned start to leaf out, you find more dead, right? Because when they're dormant, it's, I mean, if, if the stuff was dead before the freeze, that's probably pretty obvious, because dead branches have a slightly different color. But you don't know exactly how far back dead from the freeze goes. So you may go out and prune, and then as they start to leaf out, you'll find some more dead. <clears throat> so if you prune now, expect to do some touch-up pruning. If you can wait a week or two or three later than you normally prune, you may not have to do as much touch up pruning. <clears throat> so the key here is don't panic, be patient. It's, I know it's not an easy thing to do. And we gave you an extra, a brand new publication from University of Tennessee on freeze damage. It's the one that has the brown picture at the top of it. So don't assume it's dead. Some of the tender things, like figs, I mean, I normally do prune figs until well into March because they're really sensitive and just a late heavy freeze, or not a, a freeze or a heavy frost, can do additional damage. Just wait a little longer. The fig may be dead above ground, but the roots are still alive. You wait till you see some growth coming up. So um, on those things, that don't get pruned now, but get pruned after they flower. So think forsythia. You're not pruning your forsythia now, but it's a spring bloomer. Don't be surprised if you don't have as many flowers as in prior years, because the buds, some of the buds may have frozen during this freeze. So it's not dead, but the, the buds were formed last fall. They got frozen. They're not going to make a flower this year. So don't, don't panic on those either. So key, don't panic. Be patient. <laughs> Okay. What about the rose bushes? What about the rose bushes? Well, rose bushes normally get pruned just before they start to leaf out. So that's usually later in March, maybe even April. And this year, depending on how the rest of winter goes, it may, may be right back on that timeline, but I wouldn't do any pruning of roses right now. Okay? Okay, so why do we prune? We prune, well, first of all, if you have any of what we call the four Ds, if it's already dead, you can take it off any time. 
If it's disease, get rid of it before the disease starts. If it's damaged, and that can be crossing rubbing, where it's going to create a wound, which may eventually become disease, you do that. And the fourth one is what I call dysfunctional. That's the one that's going to whack you in the face every time you walk by it, or it's hanging over your sidewalk, um, and can become a liability. So those can be done at any time. The four Ds, any time. And I would tell you, whenever you go out and walk around your garden, put your pruners on your hip, and don't forget to look up. But go around and look at your shrubs and take off the four Ds every time you go out for a little stroll around your garden. We prune for size control, and my best example is everybody has seen some of the pruning that KUV has done. But really, the problem there is they're pruning to maintain their power line right away. And frankly, whoever planted that, usually a tree, under the power line planted too big of a tree. Wrong specimen to plant anywhere near a power line. So you can go back and blame the original property owner or the builder or the developer who put those things in, in a spot that they really didn't belong. More often, we're pruning for shape. If you're pruning for size, you've probably got too big of a specimen in the, in the wrong place. But we're pruning for shape and to kind of control the growth depending on where you've got it planted. So again, if you put something in a foundation bed and now it's spilling out and whacking every person who walks the sidewalk to your front door, yeah, you're going to do routine pruning to keep that back. The real reason we're pruning is to improve airflow into the shrub. And that will improve the flowering as well as if it's fruit bearing and the foliage. So always think about can I get airflow and sunshine into the middle of the plant? Because it helps that and it also reduces disease if you've got good airflow. And then we've got the convenience and safety and walking, mowing, <coughs> driving. I mean, if you've got a car that has all the new safety features on it, the number of folks who have told me that they can't back out of the garage because the backup camera sees this limb that has grown out, <laughs> so they have to go prune that off before they can back out of the garage. Yeah, I'm hearing more and more stories like that. So, annual growth cycle. This diagram was made for trees, but the real question is, when do these things go dormant? So if we've got this growth cycle, which also applies to our shrub. So clearly in the middle of summer, we've got all sorts of active growth going on. Early autumn, SD is for shorter days, right? They start daylight, the days are still 24 hours, but we have less. And growth starts to slow down, days get even shorter, and the temperatures start to drop. And it is why we highly recommend that you stop pruning by Labor Day. Because anything that you prune at Labor Day needs about six to eight weeks to harden off before we get that first frost or freeze. And so they're not really dormant until we're part way into winter. So I never start dormant pruning before January 1. And depending on how the late fall and early winter went, I may start pruning in mid-January, or it may be the 1st of February. They remain dormant all through winter, and the temperatures are usually low, not the Arctic blast. But as the temperatures start to warm up, W is warmer temperatures, they start to come out of dormancy. And that's when you see the leaf bud, and that's when you would start to prune things like roses and the like. And then, of course, we go into spring where they burst out into flower and we go through the whole growth cycle again. So dormant pruning really gets done between these two red arrows. Okay, so we talked about, Marcia talked about, um, you know, why we prune. But before you even start to prune, what do you have to think about? You really have to know your plants. You really have to know whether they're plants to be pruned this season or, or to wait till after they bloom. You don't want to kill all of your flowers. So how do you confirm the pruning season? 
you need resources. I mean, maybe it's a plant that your grandmother planted and you've grown up with it and you know it and that's fine. But for anything that you're not 100% sure of, you need some resources. Obviously, we're gonna recommend that you go to trusted resources like the Extension Service, that you go to EDU up here, Botanical Gardens. What we don't want you doing is, is going necessarily out to some of the nursery sites and people who are selling uh, who knows what, you know, for gardens, because they, they have a different motive. They're not research-based. We like to be research-based. We also, you, you know, you can call Ask a Master Gardener, and I believe this information's in your handout, and they also have a Facebook page where there's continuous discussion on different things, and you can even call the Extension Office. Okay, so that's do your research, but before you go out with your pruners on your hip, you need some protective equipment. And I will share with you that I uh, poked myself in the eye with a stick and had the worst corneal abrasion my eye doctor had ever seen went underneath my glasses. So even though you think you have glasses on and you're fine, put these on. Makes it a little tougher to get in there, underneath. So you might want, if you're doing, somebody mentioned roses, might want some heavy duty gloves. There's lots of protective equipment. Know your protective, get your protective equipment. Don't do what I did my first year at my house with rose bushes. I was out there in shorts, decided I'd start tackling them. <laughs> I've got the scars of my legs to show for it. I mean, just ridiculous. I could have taken 10 minutes and gone in and put on a pair of jeans, but I didn't. So protective equipment. We all like to forget it and just go out there and do it, but I'm telling you, you don't want to go through the six eye appointments every day and the drops and the stuff I went through. So leave it at that. So know your shrubs. Do they bloom on old wood or new wood? When do they bloom? So July 1st is kind of a good benchmark date. Things like crepe myrtles bloom after that. A lot of your hydrangeas bloom after that. They're, grow they're blooming on new wood. So it's the old wood basically that, that you, can, you can do now. So also know how old your shrubs are how fast they grow. I mean, this is all pretty common sense. But when you think about your shrub, you want to you want to think about their shape if you're trying to maintain their shape. Now, Marsha already talked about not trying to fit a shrub into a place where it really never should have been. Because that's just, you're always going to be hacking it down and it's not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. Get it out and put something there that, you know, you'll love. But know the sh basic shape, have it in your head, before you start to prune. It's important, it's kind of like flower arranging, you know, know where you're going, get the idea of the shape. So um, is it temperature sensitive? Is it daylight sensitive? And Marsha, I don't know if you have anything more to add on this slide, but. No, I would say most of them tend to be daylight sensitive, uh, which is why they tend to leaf out at about the same time, but temperature is a secondary factor, which may cause it to be a little earlier or a little later. But the primary driver really is the amount of daylight that we have. Start getting in the spring. Question on the previous slide. You had two calendars under January and February. Why are those dates circled? Because these are the dates that we're. The, yeah, presenting. today was January 24th, and we're here, and we're doing a repeat of this talk on February 4th. Okay. <laughs> Did you think these were, you had to get all your pruning done between these two dates? <laughs> That's if we, if we don't answer your question today, you have a chance to come back. <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. All right. Now, so you've done all this research, especially if, like, I, I moved to Knoxville two years ago, so I had a yard, and I had no clue what I had. By the way, this is my, my plot plan, cut down a little bit. And so, and, and I've got it, I've got it made a big copy, and it's a mess, let me tell you. I wouldn't show it to anybody. So, but what I did is you want, to, you want to take some notes because you don't want to have to start every spring and say, oh, that, what was that? How big we are? Make yourself a little journal. It can be anything. It can be a notebook. It can be a notes on your iPhone. It can be a computer file. It can be a plot plan. So right here, I have five dogwood trees. So, you know, I took my plot plan and I made one. And the one that is bigger, I've got, I've put everything in. I went around with, anybody have a picture of that on their phone? It's an app. It's a little pricey, I think. It's about $30 a year. But if you've just moved in someplace, it's worth it. I went around, I took pictures of everything, identified it, and mapped it around my, my yard. 
So this is my, and then I, and then I have a notebook and I have things like notes in the notebook to say, you know, one through five, and it's all labeled up to 47 specimens. Mm -hmm. And it'll say, you know, dogwood trees, prune after flowering. Re and I removed a third of each of these because they had been touched on 6522. And number two had a trunk that it was split and one side they had to cut off so completely. I'm gonna keep watching that and see if the tree's gonna make it because I did it last year. So then, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's whatever method you want to use. But you don't want to start from scratch every season until you really get to know your plants. Eventually, you probably won't need to refer to it. But first few times you look them up, save yourself the having to do it again. OK, again, the old wood versus new wood. I guess you're going to hear old wood, new wood a lot of times from us. <laughs> so prune well dormant. Plants to bloom on new wood, so the same year's growth. Think of the things that come out and then put out buds, not the, what you're seeing that have buds on now, that's obviously on old wood. So they tend to bloom after July 1st, Craig Myrtle, I dreamed it, I think Gary said that. That's what you're gonna do now, that's what we're talking about. But just to know that if it blooms on old wood, prior year's growth, then like, you know, Prescythia, these are all the real spring bloomers, the things you see right away. Azalea, some of the other hydrangeas. You're just going to do that, you know, a month and a half after it's done blooming to two months. But, you know, before, again, before Labor Day, nothing happens with pruning after Labor Day. And then, obviously, if you've got a hedge, a privet, a boxwood, then you just basically, same thing, prune as you go. You know, you're keeping that level or whatever. Stop on Labor Day. All right, we talked a little bit about this, about knowing the basic form of the plant. So there's a lot of different forms a plant can take. So canes, and you're probably familiar with these if you have any, if anybody's planted any berries. You know, you've got cane bushes, you've got blackberries, blueberries. Roses are also canes. <clears throat> you know, anything that is a cane, because it's a different, it's a different type of pruning that you're going to do. And we're going to get into that, but know whether it's a cane, know if it's a mounding habit, and hopefully your plants are sort of in the shape they naturally should be, unless, like we said, you've got it in the wrong spot and you've been hacking away at it. So this shouldn't be that difficult to tell. But then you've got your tree like shrubs, crepe myrtle, rhododendron, and then the hedges again. Marcia, did anything? No, we're going to touch each of these. Yeah, we're going to touch each of these. It's kind of the intro to <clears throat> talking more about them. Um, what I would add is, I think you told me you keep a page for each of your type of shrubs. So, you know, one page with, with all the notes about that particular shrub. I happen to keep my notes on a calendar, and that's why I can tell you, you know, one year winter was much milder, so I could prune in early January. Mm -hmm. Another year it stayed um, warm much longer, and come January the thing still had leaves on it, so I waited until it had dropped all the leaves and I was sure it was normal. My sister uses one of those five-year diaries. Have you ever seen those? They have the little, have the one page and, and there's a lot of blank spaces that she's able to doodle in. But so she can go back same way. Yes. And she sees like three years ago this happened, but now it's, you know, making notes of temperatures and whatever else you want. But I'd really encourage you to do what, what Breton is doing, especially if you bought a property that already had plants on it. You may have to watch them for a year or two to figure out are they a spring bloomer or a late bloomer? And things like hydrangeas, where there's so many varieties, and some get pruned while dormant, and others do not. Uh, it's a wait and see may be your, your best thing, and you want to make notes while you're doing the waiting and watching. All right, so this is just basic pruning techniques. So we've already, Marsha already really hit on the de dead disease, damage, and dysfunction. And I will tell you, when I did those dogwoods and I took out those lower branches that my husband was trying to get around with the mower. He sang my praises for a week. So <laughs> anything like that. But if, if you're, it's really a, a pain, take it off. The plants are here to enhance our lives. So know what it should look like when it's done. We've already said this. Don't ask the plant to be something it's not. When we bought the house, the previous owner kept everything cut below the gutters. He didn't feel like trees should shed their leaves into the gutters. There were a couple of trees a little closer to the house. 
that was just nuts. I was not, you know, now, they, now they're above the gutters, but they look good, and we, guess what? We have gutter covers, so like, you know, I'm not that worried about it. So um, start at the bottom and inside. And this is key, and this is where you need your safety glasses, because you're gonna crouch down, and you're gonna get in there, and you're gonna take a good look at what you got going on. Like, is it canes? How many canes do you have? And we'll talk about pruning canes specifically, but it's a good place to start. Just get in there and see what you got. And then fit out the middle as necessary. Again, airflow and sunshine. I like to think of it as, you know, when you come in from exercising or, you know, you take a shower and you're all wet, you need to dry off, right? You wouldn't walk around wet all day. If you're not pruning out your bushes so the airflow can get through there and dry them out and the sunshine can hit it and dry it out, you know, you're asking for fungus. So, or some other disease. You need to have them dry out and be able to breathe. Think of them as breathing. So, you also want to remove outliers, moon shoots. Moon shots? <laughs> moon shots. Moon shots. That's Marsh's term, moon shots. Those are the ones that come out and go sporadic. And it's real tempting to just cut them back so they're the same length as the others, but you really need to reach further down in and cut them shorter than the surrounding branches. And, you know, it was funny when I first saw this. Um, Marsha, I was thinking about my crepe myrtle that gets all those things at the bottom, all those little mm. suckers. Suckers, yeah, you suckers. You gotta, you gotta take off too. The, that st helps. the standard Nandina is a classic for putting out moonshots. Mm -hmm. But any of that little stuff, because that's that's taking energy away from the growth of the plant and its flowering capabilities. So you want to remove those those uh, suckers. It messes up the shape. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about tools a little later. But, you know, don't go out there with a chainsaw. Anybody ever seen anybody pruning with a chainsaw? <laughs> Anything that's jagged, tears things up. Oh my, no, no, don't, you know, you're only gonna use shears and hedges, you're not gonna use them on your bushes. But Marsha's gonna talk about tools and we've got some examples, so we won't dwell on that. And then, but this is a really important one too. You can't remove more than a quarter to a third of the plant without you really stressing it. I mean, think about it. You know, if you're taking off that much, it's going through some stress. So that's a safety guideline to make sure that the plant will remain healthy and viable going forward. So you gotta kind of live by that. And that's another thing you're gonna make a note of in your notebook or whatever you're doing is how much did you take off? So that you know, you know, if you, if you really wanna stress it again this year. So if you bought a property where things have not been pruned for two or three years, you may need a two or three year plan to do what's called renovation pruning on that shrub because you'd be tempted to go in and remove half of this overgrowth at one time, resist that temptation and take off a quarter to a third this year, a quarter to a third the next year, and it may take you two or three years to get it back to the way it really should look. And there are some shrubs you can cut down, to, and we'll talk about some of those too, but this is the, for the shrubs, once you've done your research, that you know, you're really not supposed to cut down to 12 inches. You're supposed to just, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, if it's really drastic and renovation pruning, that, that's a whole second topic. Before we move on, we have a question. Yes. Oh, yeah. Quite more of the little things at the bottom. Yes. Um, when you're trying to cut them out, dig them out, is, is there anything that really works with them? I just cut them low to the ground. I don't try and dig them out. I just, you don't dig them out. Yeah, I just cut them low to the ground. And yes. those suckers, the question was about suckers on the crepe myrtle. Yeah. Any time of year you see them. So if you catch them when they're early, you can snip them off with this okay, and get but really you just low. If you're not worried about it. No, no, because I mean, you're going to do it, honestly, you're going to do it two or three, four times a year because they're going to they're keep coming up. But crepe you myrtles are it. just notorious for yeah. putting up suckers. But I've never had anybody come visit me in my home and say, oh, look at yeah. <laughs> But just when you see them, take care of it. Okay, so making proper cuts. Um, let me borrow the phone for you. Oh, yes. When you look at a branch, you can either have alternating limbs or you can have opposite, right? So if you've got the alternating, the recommended cut is at a 45 degree angle such that you are above this bud. So the problem with this one is the angle is too large and therefore you've created a much larger wound than necessary. This one is too low, so this bud is not gonna survive. You will be back making a second cleanup 
snip on this one. This one is too high, and this one has to do with the opposite. Now, I will tell you, having a few plants that have opposites, it is hard to get in between those and get a nice flat cut. Mine usually end up being angular. There is some new research that says, yeah, we've recommended this for a long, long time, but depending on the size of the branch, they're starting to say, you could come over and make a cut just like you do on the opposite. So newer research is saying, make the flat cut because it's a smaller wound. But I'm here to tell you that if you're pruning a little branch that's 3 quarters of an inch in diameter, the difference in size of a wound between this cut and that cut is not very much. Now, if you've taken off a branch that's 2 or 3 inches, well, yeah, maybe then I would take the flat and make a smaller wound. But it's, um, the prevailing wisdom for years and years has been the 45 degree angle. So if you're out researching and you find some newer pub, don't be surprised if they say give us a flat top. And over here, um, these are my favorite tools. This will take me up to about a half an inch. That means I'm pruning it well, it's smaller, if I'm thinking she's got massive grip strength. Okay. <laughs> if you don't have it before, you will after, especially if you have a lot of shrubs. If it's more than a half an inch, then I get out the loppers. And um, what's nice about the loppers is with a longer handle, you've got more leverage. So this one is actually rated for up to an inch and a half. I would say I'd probably go up to an inch with this. And at an inch, then I am kind of grinding on it. Um, just a little tidbit, both with the pruners and with the loppers, the bigger the thing is you're trying to cut, the deeper you want to get it into the mouth of your cutting tool. So if it's a spindly little thing, yeah, you can snip it out here in the end, but if it's a half inch, you want to get it down in here because that's where you're going to make the best cut. And then shears, these are, these are ancient. Uh, but they're really only used on hedges. So please resist the temptation to use the manual ones or an electric one. I know electric hedge trimmers are popular, but they're, they make a really jagged, rough cut. So you're just creating the opportunity for more wound damage. So unless you truly have a hedge, put the hedge trimmers away. Um, I will allow the, that they might be useful for cutting things like ornamental grasses, where you tie them up and then you come along and cut them off. Uh, but on your shrubs, no. Put, the, put the, the, the shears away unless you've got a hedge. Okay, so dormant pruning according to form. All these pictures are of a nine bark. It is a native, um, but it gets its name from the fact, if you look at this picture, it has bark that starts to peel off, and at some point somebody said, you know, I peeled off like nine layers, and that's where it got its name, nine bark. But it is a classic cane shrub. This is what it looks like when it's fully leafed out. The flowers are really small. You have to be pretty close to see them. Um, this is a picture of what it looks like when it's dormant. So you can see all the structure. That's what's really nice. Now, cane shrubs, the research will generally tell you for specimen, keep a certain number of canes. So in roses, the general recommendation is three to five primary canes. So as I walk the neighborhood and I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> Renton uses the fingers. You know, you've got five, and then, therefore they're pretty reasonably spaced. But as I walk the neighborhood and I see roses that have 15, 20 canes, it's like, no wonder they have black spot. No wonder they have fungal diseases. There's no airflow in there. So on a cane shrub, what we're doing is going in and taking out some of the oldest canes. So when I prune my blueberries, which are a cane shrub, in, usually in February, um, whereas roses are three to five, with blueberries, you can keep 12 to 15. So what am I taking out on a blueberry? I'm taking out the little spindly things, and I take out older looking canes. Then the older ones, 
first of all, are fatter. And their wood starts to get kind of barky looking and slightly different color than the newer growth. So every year on the cane shrub, you come in and you take out, this is one, two, three, four, and I'm leaving one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm taking out four out of 13. That's about one third. How about that? <laughs> so the older canes, you're just going to cut them off as low as you can go. And you're probably using your loppers for that, right? Yes, I'm definitely using loppers on that because the older canes are going to be more than a half an inch on just about every shrub. I mean, forsythia. When you see a forsythia that's got a, a stem that's three or four inches, that thing should have been removed years ago, and then you probably need your folding saw. But you come in and you take off some of the older canes each year, and your goal is keep this thing looking like it's five or six years old. <laughs> because you take these four old canes out, guess what it's going to do? It's going to put up some more new canes for next year. So you're always going to have 12 or 13 canes on this nine bark. I'm always going to have 12 to 15 canes on my blueberries. And each year I take out a bunch of old ones and then new ones grow. But I get rid of the really spindly ones because they're probably not going to make it. And I focus on the ones that look healthy and they're properly spaced for airflow and sunshine and go from there. But never, ever, ever, ever take these to a cane shrub. When people take, for instance, you do not prune forsythias this time of year, but everybody knows what a forsythia looks like. It wants to spray. So as Breton said, don't ask a plant to be something it's not. I get distressed when I see people, see people who have planted a row of forsythia, and then they have come in and pruned them to be an upright head. Not fair to a forsythia. Go buy a plant that wants to be pruned that way. Don't, don't pick on the forsythia. It didn't do anything to deserve that. <laughs> so never shear a cane shrub. You are going in and selectively removing canes. And once you get comfortable with one cane shrub, the key factors you're looking for is when do I prune it, and how many canes should I have for it to be healthy? And then the, the technique is the same. You come in, remove the old fat ones at the bottom, take out any of the four knees, and you're done. I mean, cane shrubs take me about five to six minutes to prune. Each. Each. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Each. So those are cane shrubs. And the example I used here was a nine bark with blueberry and forsythia fall in there. Roses fall in there. Um, yeah, John Blank on a few of them. Um, the mountain habitat. Now, this is not all hydrangeas. These are the hydrangea arborescence, which include things like Annabelle, or what some folks generically refer to as the big mop heads. Big, like, big blossoms, big round yes. mm -hmm. They're a cane shrub. And so this time of year you come in, I mean, what we have here, you know, here's your big mop head. This is what it looks like in the winter if you didn't deadhead it, and that's okay. Some people keep the spent blossoms just for some winter interest. But January into February, while it's dormant, you're going to come in, and on these, this hydrangea arborescence in particular, the general recommendation is cut it back as close to the ground as you can get, an inch or two above the ground. Shave and a haircut, two bits. That's fast. If you've got an older plant that has had a tendency to flop because those big mop heads get heavy, then on the hydrangea arborescence, they actually suggest coming up 18 to 24 inches. And the higher you go, you've got a stiffer stem here, and they will flop a little less. But on a mounting plant, this is, this is fairly common. But not all hydrangeas, just the hydrangea arborescence. So, and this is where becoming familiar with the botanical names helps. Annabelle is just one specific variety, but there, there are others in that family. Yes? I know it's mounting versus uh, cane, but is it helpful at all to thin out the number of canes versus 
just cutting them all to 18 to 24? Um, no, what you'll find when you cut it back is that some of them are dead, and so you're going to pick up the dead stems, pull, you know, take those out, but you don't actually have to reduce because its nature is it's kind of self-reducing. Good question. We have another question. Yes. Sorry. Um, are oak leaf hydrangeas in this group? No, they are not. They are in a category all by themselves. Um, they do get pruned at this time of year, but the pruning of an oak leaf hydrangea is really limited. If you didn't deadhead them in the fall, you can deadhead them now. And the only other thing you really do is address the 4Ds. Crawl around around the base and find any dead stem, take that out. Any little moonshot that's becoming dysfunctional, whacking you in the face. Oak leaf hydrangeas take very little pruning. Just let it do its thing. Let it do its thing. Just recognize, here's, here's the problem that folks have. They get to be big. Yeah. They can be 12 feet by 12 feet. So I've got a neighbor who has two in the foundation bed in front of her house. They get too big. So what does she do? She has somebody prune them. When did she have them pruned? At the wrong time of year. So on one of my walks, she stops me and says, hey, you know, they were getting too big, I pruned them. And I said, think they'll bloom next year? No, because you just took all the bugs off. It's going to be two years till you bloom, so please don't pay somebody to do that again. So even if you're not doing your own pruning, I hope you learn enough today that whoever you might be paying and engaging to prune for you, you can have that conversation and test their knowledge because they'll all say, yes, I can prune that, and they'll charge you, but it doesn't mean they will prune it correctly. Now, Marcia, I've got a lot of limelight, which... Limelight falls in the hydrangea paniculata, paniculata. and we've got a picture of that coming up. Good question. Great lead. So here's the line line. There it is. <laughs> yep. Um, this is more of a tree-like shrub. So crepe myrtle falls in here. And please, don't ever do this. What do you please? call it? Crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle. Yeah, please don't do that. But down here across the bottom, this is the line light. You can see where it gets its name. But it falls in the family of hydrangea paniculata. So, Lime white and anything that has a similar sounding name is probably also a paniculata. This is what it looks like in the winter after it dropped all its leaves. And this is what it looks like when you're done pruning it. So these are all heading cuts where you're shortening almost every single branch and taking out. I mean, if you come back to here, you know, it's kind of getting cut off right across here. So all this above is going. It looks really drastic when you do this, but the result is you get this. You get bigger blooms because the energy is going to the blooms instead of supporting all of that. And so I would say if you haven't seen any of our pruning videos, we actually have a pruning video on hydrangea paniculata. The specific variety is a limelight, and it features past president, Caesar Stamp, at his property. He's got a gorgeous row of them around a retaining wall. But yeah, they looked, uh, they looked like this when he was done pruning. And yet, you can see pictures in the summer, they look like that. Trust me, they will do that. That is their nature. Can I ask a question? Yes. What do you mean when you say never remove the leader? Because like a leader is a central leader in the tree and they don't have that because they're a shrub. They don't have it. They are a multi-stemmed So tree. do they have a leader? Uh, no, they don't. Okay. Now if you look down here, he's got one, two, most of these have like two, two or three major stems. So what does it mean never remove a leader they don't have? Well, okay. That applies to things more like the crepe myrtle and um, not so much on vitex. But on the crepe myrtle, you can usually figure out which is the main stem, and yeah. you, you don't want to top that. Yeah, when you get to a leader and you cut that back, you are topping. And then, just for completeness sake, does anybody have a hedge? Mm -hmm. I see one. How big is the hedge? You mean lengthwise yeah, or like height? 
Oh, length? Fifteen feet. Fifteen feet. Okay, so it's not quite like this one where it looks like it goes all the way around the driveway. No. Yeah. Um, again, primarily here you're addressing the four Ds, and the key on the hedge is always keep the base wider than the top, and that's so that you get sunlight into the base. If you do it this way, what happens? All this stuff down here at the bottom gets no sunlight, and the next thing you know, it's brown. And that's where you can see into the bottom of the shrub. So when you see a shrub that's kind of empty at the bottom, it's because, primarily, could be several reasons, but primarily it was improperly pruned. Similarly, I like to call these meatballs. <laughs> but the problem with the meatball is the same thing, is you come around the bottom, <coughs> and the bottom part gets no sunlight, or very little sunlight, and it will just die. Can't do photosynthesis. And then it looks kind of scrubby. So go for a mound rather than a meatball. And I'll just comment on this beautiful hedge. I mean, they're incredibly lucky. Our neighbor, my neighbor has a beautiful hedge with big gaps missing from where the various boxwoods have gotten boxwood disease and died. So that's why the new thinking is, totally off topic, but the new thinking is, you know, you would do a, a mixed variety, so that if something caught something, it's not going to transmit it. You, you have some break in that the hedge and planting mm -hmm. planting on the specimen, um, right? But on the hedge, keep the base wider. Use shears. This is when you would use shears, and you're cutting back basically how much grew last year. You're not going real deep. And you're going to do it multiple times. You're probably going to do it in March. You're probably going to come in and touch it up again in April. You're probably going to touch it up in May. You're probably going to touch it up in June. Because pruning stimulates growth. So you prune it, and one spot in the hedge decides, hey, I'm going to grow. Boom. So now you've got a mini moonshot coming out of here, right? which is really obvious. So periodically, you're going to take your walk around and snip those off. And then every few years, this is the hard part with the hedge. You should put on some long cuffed gloves and start to dig into the plant and remove some of the thickness. And what you'll find is all the green foliage is on the outside and on the inside is all brown wood because guess what? Very little sunshine gets into the middle of the hedge. And look, you're supposed to stop when? Labor Day. Because <laughs> even that needs time to harden up. Okay, so to wrap this up, remember the four Ds. You can do those any time of year. So just always have your pruners, snip off the little stuff. Don't forget to look up, because not everything is, is down low or at eye level. Uh, I always like to start at the bottom, even on a multi-stem, because it's, you definitely do that with a cane truck. If you've got a cane shrub, like the nine bar, you can start pruning from the outside, but by the time you're done and you find to say, oh yeah, here's this big old thick cane, let me cut it off at the bottom. If you do that first, you've made one cut, not five or six, in working your way down. Uh, but the same works on the multi-stem shrubs, uh, the things that are like small trees. I just always start at the bottom. And so one of the other pieces of gear that I didn't bring is a big, thick, kneeling pad. Because I spend a lot of time on my knees. If you watch some of the pruning videos, I kind of disappear into the shrub, but you can still hear me. <laughs> and the focus is on the base of the shrub, but you may not see my face. In the I do the opposite. I, I've got the knee pads. I just strap yeah. them on, and I'll walk around in them all day, and, and then wherever you, so you could do either one. But yeah, that's part of your protective, you don't want your knees, you're, you're, especially if you're kneeling on a you know, the driveway to get into, the, you're kneeling on concrete, not a good thing. Well, this, this time of year, the ground is quite cool and damp. Mm -hmm. And you're going to last about 60 seconds before you said, man, my, my knees are cold and wet, and that's uncomfortable. Uh, prune for air and sunshine. Keep that in mind. I, I can't drill that home too much. Uh, let that be your, your driving factor. Keep a calendar or a journal. Remember the before and after July 1. Uh, flowering shrubs, remember new wood. New wood is, I'm going to prune it while it's dormant. 
It's going to send out new stuff, and that's where the blossoms are going to be. Old wood is not ancient wood. It's just last year's wood. And those are the things that are blooming this spring, like the forsythia, right? Forsythia got pruned last year after flowering. Then it put out some new growth and formed buds last fall. Another reason to stop pruning by the Labor Day. And now they're going to bloom this spring. So those, those get pruned after flowering. Uh, remember the one-third rule. Now, if you've got a really bad shrub, you, you have a choice. You can make it one cut. Get the guy who has the chainsaw and take it off at ground level. Or you can decide this is going to be a two or three year renovation project. Those are times when you exceed the one third rule. Those are pretty drastic. Yeah, and if it doesn't come back up, you were, you know, you were ready to cut it off at the ground anyway, so you plant something different. But you're taking a little bit more of a risk than stretching it over you know, two or three years. Hedges, always wider at the bottom than at the top. Use the right tools um, and keep them sharp and sanitize them. Oh, yeah. I am a fan of Lysol. Mm -hmm. And so I will spray my pruners as I move from one plant to the next plant to another plant. That's really important in the boxwood hedge. If you've got any boxwood damage or that you're cutting out because it's and you, you use those pruners and then go down to the next box where you've just transferred. Right. And if I know I've got disease, then I'm going to spritz my pruners between each cut. But at a minimum, I, put, I spray them as I move from one plant to the next when there's no disease. Um, wear your PPE <laughs> and watch our prune like a prune videos. Has anybody watched any of those? Hi, I'm Marshall Layman. I'm a Knox County Master Gardener. I'm not in all of them, but I'm in a lot of them. Uh, so we now have that as a separate playlist, so you don't have to search quite as hard for them. And so, and if this is on your handout too, this will take you right to. Yes, we now have a QR code that you can scan the QR code and go directly to that Pro Michael like Pro playlist. And that came from the Ask a Master Gardener folks who field a lot of questions at public events. So they're creating a separate little handout, and they created the QR code. But we're using it. <laughs> and again, the, the phone number is into both the Ask a Master Gardener. If you've got a really tricky question, you can call the Extension Office, and you might get one of the agents. You never know. Neil Denton might call you back. <laughs> or it could get routed over to a Master Gardener. And then Master Gardeners, we have a website which lists all of our events. We have a Facebook page where Brett mentioned earlier. People will post questions there, so you can go and look and see, has anybody else asked this question and what was the discussion around that? So are there other questions? Mm. Yes? Do you ever put anything um, on the, after you've cut the plant, do you ever put anything to like seal it off? Okay, so the question is, after you've made a cut, do you ever seal it off? Yeah. Generally, no. Okay. I mean, there was a time when they used to suggest that if you like cut, put a band-aid on the cut or something. Maybe. Well, they would put some type of sealant on a tree cut. Yeah. That's not recommended. That actually creates more decay. Okay. But I would say there is one exception, and that's on roses. Okay. And we, we've got a rose guru sitting here in the front row. But on roses, when you make when you cut a cane that is larger than the diameter of a number two pencil, you put a blob of glue on it. <laughs> Good old Elmer's glue. And they make green Elmer's glue that you can get at Dollar Tree. <laughs> now why do we do that? Because once a rose cane is that big, a borer can get in. So if you watch the rose pruning video, our guru was in that video, I was behind the camera. But we were pruning somebody else's roses, not hers. And what did we find? Four or five canes that had borers in them. And so as we pruned that thing, anytime we made a cut on a cane larger than a number two pencil, we put a blob of glue on the top of it. And that will last long enough to discourage the borer. I mean, that's all you want. And that's all you want. You're just discouraged. You need to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you have more Rose questions, I'll point you at Carol and Bella. <laughs> <laughs> now, you had a question. I'm, I'm, well, we listed in your handout. This is a great publication from from the University of Tennessee. University of Tennessee. It's publication 1619. So if you go out to the University of Tennessee Extension site and you can type in their little search bar, Pub 1690. It's 15 pages, so we didn't print one out for everybody. But it's it's really a great resource. It's not. It's I would say fairly light reading, but efficient reading. And but if you want more in depth. We recommend Cass Turnbull's Guide to Pruning. Yeah, well, so, Cass Turnbull, so just a moment. Sure. This, the UT publication has a great plant list, and what's nice about it is there are plants that grow in Tennessee. So let me just see if.